Chapter 14. A River of Hope. I didn't meet Yimu that evening, nor at any time during my first few days. I heard him sometimes. I think it was him, laughing rather too loudly, breaking something precious judging by Mrs Chen's screams. Knocking on my bedroom door, then disappearing at the chilling sound of his father's voice. I tried to conjure up a picture of him, but it was never very flattering. I didn't want him to be attractive, didn't want him to be kind and caring. That way it would be easy to hate him. I wanted to go home. I would rather have remained unmarried for the whole of my life and be with my mother than become the daughter-in-law of Mrs Chen. My room became my sanctuary. I dreaded leaving it in the morning, couldn't wait to rediscover it in the evening. I spent hours standing by the window, watching the mist and smog spiralling lazily round the grey tenement blocks lower down, hoping for a gap to appear so that I could see beyond. Then suddenly, after nine days, it cleared. Watery yellow sunlight seeped through the thinness of my curtains, rousing me before my wake-up bell. I leapt from my bed to gaze out on a brilliant blue sky. I was amazed to discover that far below, beyond the graveyard of fallen dwellings, a river, much, much bigger than the one at home, was leading its own life. Boats of all shapes and sizes were travelling up and down, ant-sized people were busying themselves on the shores, an endless stream of vehicles was carrying produce to and from the boats. In some curious way, that river spelled freedom. It came from somewhere, and it went somewhere. It was my river of hope. As long as I could see it, the door of my prison would stay open. I was delighted to learn that Mrs Chen was going out that afternoon. She gave me an impossibly long list of duties and locked the door behind her, but she couldn't dampen my spirits. The moment she left, I set about my work with renewed vigour. Even the thought of the criticism I would undoubtedly suffer later couldn't spoil my mood. As I sang, I worked, all the songs I used to sing with my father. I danced around with a damp cloth, stood on the broom and seesawed backwards and forwards, polished the top of the sideboard with a flourish of the duster. A slight movement by the door caught my eye. I stopped, rigid with fright. It's good to see you enjoying your work, Lucianne. The voice is smooth as silk. Mrs Hong, in her wheelchair, eyes sparkling with amusement. I'm sorry, Mrs Hong, I hope I didn't disturb you. Apology not accepted, said Mrs Hong. There's not enough singing in this household. Now, dear, what about making us a nice pot of tea and then you can read to me? But what about the dusting, Mrs Hong? Mrs Chen said... I shall tell my daughter-in-law that the dust would wait, but I wouldn't. I shall be in my room, whirling around like an impatient child, so be quick with our tea so that I don't exhaust myself. She grinned at me mischievously before she spun away down the hall, leaving me holding the duster and wondering whether it would be all right to do as she asked. I decided that I couldn't refuse her and would just have to hope that Mrs Chen would not be angry with me. Besides, I was curious to explore the other wing of the apartment, to discover where Mrs Hong spent her time. I walked carefully along the pale, intricately patterned silk carpet, carrying a tree, tray with the pot of boiling hot tea and two delicate porcelain bowl, bowls, scared stiff that I might spill some. Mrs Hong heard the bowls rattle and opened her door wide. Bless you, child. Come in and put the tray on the table, then sit yourself down while I pour. I'm not totally useless, you'll see. Of course not, I said, feeling very awkward and shy. I'm sure you can do lots of things, if I'm allowed to. Miss Mrs Hong. Everyone fusses so. My legs gave up years ago, and my eyesight's not so good, which is why I would like you to read to me, but the rest of me is in full walk working order. As if to prove her point, she picked up the teapot with a flourish, began pouring, then raised it to a great height above each bowl, and lowered it again while pouring all the time. She didn't spit a drop, and looked thoroughly pleased with herself. I'll teach you how to do it one day, she said. Now, drink up and tell me a little about yourself. My son says that you are an orphan, poor child, and that your uncle has asked us to train you in domestic service until you are old enough to seek work for yourself. It was lucky for you that we had a vacancy. So strange that Mrs Wu left so suddenly. I was dumbfounded. Not only had Mr Chen kept the truth about Mrs Wu's departure from his mother, but he had lied to her about me. I wasn't an orphan. How dare he say that my mother was dead? She wasn't dead. I was going to go home to her. She wasn't dead. You are very pale, Lucianne, Mrs Hong said quietly, and so very young. I hope you will turn to me for help if you have any worries. That silky voice wrapped itself comfortingly, coaxingly around me. I looked up at her kindly face and wanted to share everything with her there and then. But how could I, without revealing that her son and daughter-in-law had lied to her?
I nodded my head and said simply, I shall enjoy reading to you, Mrs Hong. I used to read to my father. Then after we have finished our tea, you shall choose a book and we shall begin. I asked Mrs Hong about the river down below. When she told me it was the Yangtze, I realised just how far from home I had travelled. What are all the fallen buildings? That's the old town, Mrs Hong explained. It is being pulled down because it is liable to flood when the level of the river rises. This new town was built and everyone was rehoused here. Those who farm the land further down have been given jobs in factories. My father was a farmer, I said. He would have hated to work in a factory. So should I, my dear, so should I. But the youngsters, well, many of them prefer it. It can be easy money compared to toiling on the land. I like to be out in the fresh air, I said, and wondered when I might be allowed to go outside and explore. The books in Mrs Hong's room, unlike those in the study, were dog-eared and inviting. I chose one at random, sought Mrs Hong's approval, then sat down to read. I was nervous at first, certain I would not be up to the task, but as the story unfolded and Mrs Hong nodded encouragement, closing her eyes to listen more attentively, I relaxed and began to lose myself in the story. Page after page went by, my voice the only sound to break the peace. A clock struck suddenly. Mrs Hong opened her eyes. You read very well, Lucy Ann. Mrs Wu was a trifle monotonous, bless her. We will do this again, but now I'm going to help you with your dusting. I was amazed that Mrs Hong would even consider helping me. She had reached her door before I could attempt to stop her and began hurtling down the hall as though in a race. Just as she reached the door to the apartment, it opened and she crashed into it, causing it to rebound into the shopping laden Mrs Chen. I was so shocked and at the same time the scene struck me as so comical that I hooted with laughter. A brief hysterical hoot, but it was noted even in the confusion. For a moment, Mrs Chen stood thunderstruck. Then she dropped her shopping, pushed past Mrs Hong and made a grab for me. How dare you mock me! She shrieked. Who gave you permission to enter this area of our apartment the minute my back was turned? You know very well it was me, said Mrs Hong calmly. I am to blame, so please don't take it out on the poor child. The poor child has been nothing but trouble since she arrived. She needs to understand her place here, while you, dear mother-in-law, need to understand that old women do not go wasting round in wheelchairs with the servants. You, dear daughter-in-law, need to understand your place here. I am the head of this household, and if I wish Lucianne to read to me, then so she shall. We'll see about that, fumed Mrs Chen. Go to the kitchen now, Lucienne. I shall expect to find that you have done everything I asked. She took hold of the arms of the wheelchair turned it round and pushed Mrs Hong back to her room. Chapter 15. A Prisoner A month went by, a month in which I began to feel like a prisoner. Apart from the shopping trip on my first morning, I hadn't left the apartment. Mrs Chen filled every minute of my day with chores, appearing from nowhere time and again to check that I was doing as she had asked and doing it properly. Her criticisms were endless and soul-destroying. My only lifeline was Shang Fei, his arrival three times a day lifted my despair. Mrs Chen clearly suspected as much and kept a careful eye on us, flirting more and more outrageously with him while doing her best to make me look like a foolish little girl. We laughed in turn at her arrogance and stupidity, laughter which kept me going from one meal time to the next. During that long first month, I saw neither Mr Chen nor Yimu. They left the apartment immediately after breakfast and disappeared when they returned in the evenings into the rooms that were out of bounds to me. I felt that Yimu, that perhaps Yimu was being kept away from me deliberately. And then, on the fifth Saturday after Uncle had taken me to market, Mrs Chen informed me that from the next day and every Sunday onwards, I was to cook for the whole family, all three meals, and serve them as well. Your uncle assured Mr Chen that you can cook, so now you can prove it, she said, smiling, as though setting a test in which she was sure I would fail. She gave me strict instructions on every aspect of what I was to cook that first Sunday, when it was to be served, how it was to be served, and what was expected of me. I was aghast. How could I possibly do it all on my own? My mind froze as she spoke, unable to take in the bombardment of min minute details. And then, worse as she left the room, I realised that I was bound to meet Yimu for the first time. Shang Fei's arrival that Saturday evening did little to cheer me up. He talked me step by step through the preparation of the dishes I was to cook, muttering angrily about Mrs Chen's spitefulness in setting me such a task. He was also furious about the fact that without any warning or discussion, 
he was to lose a whole day's work. She just uses people, then spits them out when she no longer has any need for them. Now she asks you, an 11-year-old, to do the work of an experienced chef. Chef, she's using you like a slave, lucy -Ann. Have you written to your mother yet? I shook my head miserably. I can't tell her. I just can't. She can't take me back. Uncle made that clear. How can I worry her when there's nothing she can do to help? Then give me your uncle's dress, address and let me write to him. He's your family. He should be looking after you. Uncle hates me. It was his idea to send me away in the first place. But how can you stay here, Lucianne? I have no choice, I replied. I have no choice, I said to myself, over and over again in my room later that evening, as I gazed out of the window only to discover that the river had disappeared once more beneath a thick blanket of mist. I had thought about escaping, just simply running away, but I had no money. Mrs Chen was careful to keep the apartment door locked, and where would I go anyway? My future looked as bleak as the shadowland below, my determination to go home to my mother faltering when little more than a month had passed. Chapter 16. Have to kiss it better. Sunday arrived with the wake-up bell at 5.30. Though the sun had yet to rise, I could see that the mist and smog were lying in wait for me, blotting out the river and its hint of hope. I dragged myself into my uniform, exhausted before a day that promised me no rest had even begun. I looked in the mirror and wondered anew at who the girl standing there was. The air of resignation had now overwhelmed her. You're here to stay, the girl in the mirror seemed to say. There's no point in fighting it. I was grateful to discover that Xiong Fei had chopped up some of the vegetables in advance and left them in the refrigerator, as well as preparing the plates of preserved meats and pickles. I struggled to remember what he had said about oven temperatures, how much oil to use, which spices belonged with which dish. I set the table in the dining room while trying to sort things out in my mind, then returned to the kitchen to measure out noodles and rice and carve up the chicken and beef. How well these people eat, I reflected, compared to my family and friends back home. But how well are they going to eat today? I couldn't help smiling wryly. I flattened a chicken breast, picked up a cleaver and sliced through the top of my finger. Droplets of blood fell to the floor as I dashed for the cold tap. I held my finger under the running water, desperate to curb the spill of blood red. But though it wasn't too serious a cut, the blood kept flowing. I grabbed the tea cloth and wrapped it round my hand. A deep red stain spread relentlessly through the material as I ransacked the drawers for something to bind the cut. All I could think of was that time was passing and I hadn't even started cooking. I found some plastic film, tore off a strip and wound it round and round the top of my finger, hoping to contain the bleeding for long enough to, and to enable me to cook and serve the meal. I could hear voices. My time was nearly up. I plunged the rice into a pan of boiling water, heated the oil in the two woks, tipped in some chopped onion, garlic and ginger, finished carving the chicken and beef, separated them into the two woks, tossed them about in the oil, added various sauces, herbs and spices, and prayed that I had got it right. I carried the cold dishes through to the dining room, placed them round the edges of the revolving tray in the middle of the table, and ret returned to the kitchen to find Mrs Chen standing there. There is blood on the floor, Lucianne, she pointed to the teacloth. There is blood on this teacloth. Lucianne, do you have any idea how unhygienic that is? Do you have any idea what a health risk that is? I'm sorry, Mrs Chen. I cut my finger and... I don't care if you cut your throat. I will not have my kitchen contaminated by you. How do I know that you haven't infected our food with your blood? I was very careful to... to careful you are not, Lucianne. Careful people do not drop plates, do not spill food, do not take slices out of their fingers. You will throw this tea cloth away, you will clean up your blood with disinfectant, and I shall expect you to serve us in ten minutes. Behind her, the saucepan of rice bubbled angrily, came to the boil, and hissing water spilled all over the top of the oven. Mrs Chen turned to look, then stormed out of the room, leaving me to fume at the injustice of her attack. I hurled the soiled cloth into the bin. I mopped savagely at the blood-spotted floor. I felt like screaming obscenities for the whole world to hear. I was doing my best. Why was my best never good enough? I stamped over to the oven and was sickened to find that one of the sauces over the meat had reduced to almost nothing, while the other was thick and glutinous. The meat itself was sticking to the bottoms of the woks. I poured some boiling water from the rice into the woks and stirred frenziedly, trying at the same time to free the meat and thin the sauces some of which spattered down the front of my uniform. The clock on the wall told me I had two minutes left before I had to present myself in the dining room. I drained the rice and tipped it into a bowl, 
I stood outside the dining room with the bowl of rice. This was the moment I had been dreading. I saw Mrs Hong first, who smiled kindly. Seated next to her, Mr Chen simply nodded. By his side, the finely dressed young man stared at me, and his cheeks flushed pink. He was so handsome that I must have gawked, because Mrs Chen said sharply, Don't play the peasant, please, Lucianne. I placed the bowl in the centre of the table, stood back and waited for instructions. There was silence. Then Mrs Chen said, Where are the hot towels, Lucianne? My stomach plunged. Nobody had said anything about providing hot towels at breakfast time. It was first thing in the morning. Surely hot towels weren't needed when everyone had so recently washed. I'm sorry, Mrs Chen. I didn't realise. We always have hot towels before every meal. I'm sure I told you. Too late now. We'll have to do without. No hot towels, Grandma? Yimu leant conspiratorially across the table to whisper loudly to Mrs Hong. No, dear, not today. Never mind, though. It won't harm us. What are you waiting for now, Lucian? Dish out some rice and hand round the cold meats. Mrs Chen tried to make herself appear agreeable. A smile on her lips after she spoke, while her husband sat patiently waiting, showing no sign of involvement with anything that was going on around him. I carefully put a spoonful of rice into Mrs Hong's bowl, for which she thanked me, served Mrs Chen and Mr Chen, then bent over Yimu to reach his bowl. He beamed up at me, a face of pure innocence, turned towards his father and said, Pretty girl. Mr Chen gave a brief nod. Mrs Chen told him sweetly not to embarrass me. When I passed round the preserved meats, he beamed at me again, then leant across the table to whisper to Mrs Hong. Pretty girl, Grandma. Eat your food, Yimu, Mr Chen said sternly. I disappeared back to the kitchen to fetch the hot dishes. The pieces of beef were stuck together in their glue-like sauce. The chicken was blackened in places where it had burnt at the bottom of the wok. I tried to disguise the worst with carefully positioned vegetables, but I knew that such subterfuge would not escape Mrs Chen's eagle eye. At least I had managed not to overcook the pat choy. I carried the dishes through and waited for the inevitable smile-disguised tongue lashing. You may serve us with more rice, then return to the kitchen to begin washing up, Mrs Chen ordered. I filled one bowl after the other as before. When I reached Yimu, he suddenly pointed at my hand and said very solemnly, Nasty cut. Have to kiss it better. With that, he took hold of my wrist and was about to kiss my finger when Mr Chen pulled him away and said firmly, No, Yimu, you don't touch. I was sent back to the kitchen then, while Yimu leaned across to Mrs Hong and whispered, Nasty cut, Grandma. I was in turmoil as I scrubbed away at the dirty pans. It wasn't that Mrs Chen would come in soon to demolish me over the dreadful meal. It was Yimu. It seemed... I was destined to marry a boy who was as handsome as any girl could wish, but who acted like a very young child, though he looked about 18. I didn't have time to think about it for too long. Mrs Chen strode in, and the expected castigation took place. The food wasn't fit for a peasant. Mr Chen had been assured by my uncle that I was a good cook, so I'd better not be there under false pretenses. There was plenty left, which I was welcome to. Lunch had better be much improved. I was to make a start on it as soon as I had eaten and finished clearing up. One last thing, Lucianne, Mrs Chen said quietly. He is harmless. You will always have a roof over your head and you will never want for money. I think you can count yourself lucky, don't you? I wanted to knock the sickly smile off her face and scream, No, 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 I am not lucky. I am the unluckiest girl in the whole of China. But I wasn't expected to reply. Mrs Chen had already gone. I fetched the bowls of discarded food from the dining room and sat down to eat, but I had lost my appetite. I didn't care about having a roof over my head. After all, Mother and I had managed without one once upon a time. I didn't care about money. We had never had money. Not much, anyway. I remembered one of my father's favourite sayings. If you realise that you have enough, you are truly rich. The Chens had more than enough money. But, but were they truly rich? Mr Chen with his empty eyes, Mrs Chen with her heart of stone... I could see it all now. I was being trained to look after Yimu, to take over from Mrs Chen, and, as his wife, it would be much more difficult for me to leave him than if I was simply a paid servant. I was in trouble again at lunchtime. I forgot the soup. The scolding missed its target this time, though. I was too busy wondering if Yimu knew that I was to marry him. I caught him gazing at me adoringly, as small children sometimes do, and wished that I could just be friends with him. By the evening, I was so tired that I could hardly keep my eyes open. 
Disaster struck when I managed to ladle soup into Mrs Hong's lap. Yimu burst out laughing, then clamped his hand over his mouth when he saw his father's face. Mrs Chen leapt to her feet, called me a stupid clumsy child, and said that perhaps she was mistaken in thinking she could turn a sow's ear into a silk purse. Mrs Hong patted me on the back and told me not to worry, that it had been a long day. The poor child's exhausted, she declared to Mr Chen. Let her have a bowl of food, then send her to her room. We can sort ourselves out here for once. Mr Chen nodded, but I knew from the look on Mr. Chen's, Mrs Chen's face that she was furious again with her mother-in-law for interfering. The poor child's exhausted, I heard Yimu repeat as I left the room. The poor child is being spoiled, I heard Mrs Chen retort.